So this talk is about how do we uh, stop writing spaghetti code. And, and this is, I think, a lot of the lessons here are applicable to all JavaScript, but it was specifically aimed at uh, Node.js because that's something that I personally have been working with a lot. And I think the uh, Node makes more use of JavaScript in some ways or different uses of JavaScript than uh, the kind of code that I personally have been writing on the browser for years. And I think there was a large part of learning curve in order to deal with that. And I think what was interesting to me was I feel like now I actually know JavaScript better through using it in an abstract environment, which wasn't the browser, and using it in an environment which was completely separate from all this kind of front-end coding that I've been doing for years. And I feel like that actually made me uh, a stronger, better coder with a better understanding of, of how JavaScript itself works. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the stuff in here is definitely applicable to front-end coding as well. Um, but it's the talk specifically is aimed at uh, coding with Node.js primarily as a server-side JavaScript um, framework, but I guess you could also apply it to other server-side JavaScript. Um, my name is Tom Hughes Croucher. Uh, I'm a technology evangelist at Yahoo. Um, that means that uh, I go around and talk about things a lot. Um, but I also get the opportunity to learn about these new technologies. Um, and I get to see what's happening, get to see what's interesting. And uh, Node in particular, I think, is one of my favorite technologies because I feel like it's really uh, pushing what we're able to do. It's taken a concept that people have been talking about for years, and it's really made something happen with it. It's really taken that idea of, well, what could we do with JavaScript on the server? And it's really pushing the boundaries. So this story is a lot about the event loop. And I think in general, even though we have to use the event loop on clients, people don't really think about it. It's just kind of one of those things that for the most part works and people don't really pay attention to it. It's not, you know, it's not in the forefront of people's minds. And I think if you asked most front-end engineers, most web developers, you know, they may not have even heard of the event loop, let alone kind of have a clear understanding that it works. Sure, they know that they use events, but what is this, this thing, the event loop? What is the thing about this thing that, that makes it different and special and interesting? And, and, and what effect does it have on the way that we code? So I personally think, um, my honest belief is that people intuitively get event-driven programming. Um, I just think it's one of those things um, that's a natural part of just being human. Um, and my example for this is, is you know, it's very simple. It's cooking. Um, hands, do people cook? Hands up, I cook. I'm vegetarian. I have to cook. Um, so a bunch of people cook. Um, hands up, who can cook uh, ramen? Yeah, you see, that, that counts. <laughs> um, so in this, in this particular example, and it, and it was funny, I was kind of drawing this, and I drew my own kitchen. Um, it's kind of the archetypal kitchen. It turns, to be, it turns out to be mine. Um, but... You know, if I'm chopping a bell pepper, if I'm chopping some vegetables and a pot on the stove starts to boil over, you know, I don't ignore the pot. It's not, it's not that, you know, this event that's happening, the pot is boiling over. It's not that I don't deal with that. But the first thing, you know, it's kind of, I don't stop mid-slice and drop my knife and, you know, it's kind of finish the, the current task that I'm doing, which is, you know, a particular slice, put the knife down, turn the stove down, and then I can carry on. And, and this is, humans just, you know, we're used to being interrupted. You know, it's not, you know, it's not we do a task and, you know, we absolutely, you know, nothing else can interrupt us. We're used to this idea that stuff happens, you react to that thing and you do it. But at the same time, we don't do two things at once. And I know everybody's going to be like, yeah, but I can like pat my head and rub my tummy. Um, you, if you actually ever try doing two things that require you to think, at the same time, that requires some kind of cognitive interaction. You can't do it. It's impossible. Humans have one conscious chain of thought. And this is like the event loop. The event loop is the same thing, where it's really great at context switching. It can jump between different tasks very fast. It's OK with the idea of an event popping up and going, hey, I need doing. But it only does one thing at a single time. So I, I feel like this is something that you know, we all just intuitively get. And when people, you know, complain about, oh, I started coding for Node, 
and it's all really confusing and what the hell's going on. Um, the fact that you've done procedural coding doesn't mean that you don't get this. It just means that you don't understand the event loop. And once you understand the event loop, and once you can associate the event loop with just real life, you'll find it a lot easier. So, you know, the way to think of this is multitasking one thing at a time. It's my, my fun oxymoron for the morning. But, you know, it's all about this very fast context switching. I'm only doing one thing at a time, but I'm just switching between tasks one by one. So um, this, this talk is, is somewhat full of, of terribly bad analogies. So I hope you enjoy them. Um, I'm from Britain. We call them postmen. Um, you guys may call them mailmen, um, although I'd like to point out that all men are obviously male. Um, so, uh, fact. Well, actually, living in San Francisco, that may not be true. But um, in general, all men are male. Uh, so if you think of the, the postman, the postman has a bag full of events, letters, to deliver. And he needs to deliver them to um, the different callbacks. So that the callback you know, is attached to an event. When this event happens, I want to do something. So if you're programming the browser, on click, on, you know, on load, there's you know, all of these, on mouse over, there's all of these events that are DOM driven. If we're programming on the server, we tend to get a much wider range. And I think for people, I mean, this conference um, is easy. I think people that use YUI are already much more familiar with you know, custom events. They're much more familiar with the idea that events aren't just DOM events because you know, YUI encourages you to use that. And I think that's important. I think if, if uh, you know, a lot of people that have used other frameworks or are more familiar with other frameworks maybe don't get this idea that kind of it's not just this limited subset of events, but... For, for me, it's this idea that you know, events could be anything. And we take the, the postman, he takes an event. So he's got, here's something he has to deliver. And he walks down the callback. So I think of the callbacks as paths. I've got a callback. I get my event. And I deliver the letter by walking down the callback. And here you go. Here's, you know, here's the end result of that. But the point is that the postman's only got one set of legs. He can't walk down three callbacks at once. He walks down one, and when he's finished, he can then deliver the next letter. So it's, it's this sequence of things. And I think this is really important because when you add a bunch of listeners, so you add a listener for on-click or you, you know, in the browser, or you add a listener for I've got a new request in Node, is it's not trying to fire all of those events at once. If you fire an event it will run the first callback for that event in its entirety. When all of that code is finished in its entirety, it will then do the next one. And when all of that code is finished in its entirety, it will then do the next one. So it's this sequence of things. And this is really important because people um, worry about race conditions. People worry about, you know, how do I... Uh, you know, how do I make sure that these things don't execute at the same time? You can't make them execute at the same time because JavaScript doesn't work that way. And this is, I feel, a massive, massive advantage to JavaScript because um, has anybody ever tried to program something like Erlang or, or Java concurrency? Um, I, I did some of that in college, um, I assume because my professors hated me. Um, it's, it's really painful. The idea of, you know, trying to, trying to know what state different parts of the system are in at the same time and keep that state and as the message passing and you know you're trying to make sure that things don't get out of state and you don't create a deadlock and you know all of that stuff just is awful and one of the reasons why I think that Node is so interesting is because with this event loop model where there's nothing that happens in parallel everything is just a sequence you can't trip yourself up you can't create a race condition because, or you can create a race condition, but you, you can't um, unwittingly create a race condition because everything happens in the sequence. So I think this is really powerful. So let's take, uh, so this is some node code. Um, you know, hopefully for those of you that aren't super familiar with node, the code's still fairly easy. We, you know, we're going to walk through it um, and we're going to see what happens. Uh, let me just talk through the code really quickly for those that aren't familiar with node. So the first thing is in Node we have this concept of modules. So var HTTP, um, and we're requiring, so we're including a module which is the HTTP library. So we, we say, I want the HTTP library, which has got all the HTTP functionality in. 
The next thing we do is we create a server. Um, so we call the HTTP create server, um, and that's a um, it's a factory method that returns an instantiated object from a pseudo class called server. Kind of makes sense. So it, it returns an HTTP server object. The next thing we do is we add an event listener. So the way that Node does this, it has this this class called event emitter, um, which is a superclass of the server, um, and we can attach an event called request. So the event we're going to um, have fired is called request, and we pass it this anonymous function. So we, we create a new function to, to create a closure around the request. Um, and it gets a request and response object. Um, it writes some stuff to the response. Um, after that, we then tell the server to listen, and we finally we spit out something to our, lo to our log just saying, I start the server. So, so how does this work? What, is, what actually happens when I run this code? So the first thing that happens is, uh, I guess I think of it as a main loop, which is maybe the fact that I've done like Java or Python programming. I mean, you know, that kind of idea makes sense in my mind. Maybe there's a better term for it. Um, maybe we just don't want to use a term from Java. I'm cool with that. Um, but I guess it's slightly chopped. You can see that we've got an arrow uh, on the sort of left-hand side of the screen. And what happens is the, the very first thing that Node does is Node says, you've given me a JavaScript file. Um, I'm just going to run top to bottom down this code. So it reads the, the, uh, the statements that instantiate. It reads the fact that I've set an event handler. Um, and it reads the fact that I've done two other things. So we kind of we run down this, um, and we go sort of uh, top to bottom. And we end up, at the end of step one, after evaluating all this code, we end up with uh, some variables. So we've got an HTTP variable, which represents the HTTP module. Um, we've got the uh, server variable, which represents the server we created. And then we've created this listener. So we've got a listener that's sitting, waiting for events. So the, first, the very first thing that, that we do is we do the first pass around the loop. So we've done a pass, and we've got an instantiated set of stuff. right? The next thing that we do is we loop. Um, so I've sort of, you can see I've sort of starred the event listener. And that's because in this step, this is the actor. So obviously, this is a really simple example. There are much more complicated examples. And obviously, underneath all of this, if you actually dove through the HTTP server itself, there's going to be a bunch of you know, other event listeners and other stuff inside there. But you know, I'm trying to hide the complexity to make this easy. The, you know, inside this, we're looking where we say, do we have any active listeners? We do have an active listener. We've got a listener that's waiting for requests. So um, we wait. We wait to see if something happens. Now, obviously, if you use a browser, you know, the, the JavaScript is live for as long as you run the page. Because Node's a server, Node doesn't do that. Node runs the JavaScript until it has a reason not to run the JavaScript. So in this context, it's really important that we actually have an event listener. If, if, in, if we go back um, to step one, if, if we didn't have that server to on, if we didn't create an event listener, if we didn't create something that's sitting around waiting for events, when we got to step two, it would say, do we have any event listeners? No. Well, why do I need to run anymore? I don't. There's nothing that I need to wait for, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna quit. And I'm, you know, I've, I've evaluated all the JavaScript, I've run it all, and I'm done. But because we have that active event listener, we wait to see what events are gonna hit that listener so we can evaluate them. And of course, step three is we get an event call. So now um, our arrow is smaller. It's, it's just evaluating that function inside the listener. So a request event is issued, um, and since we have that listener that, that's listening for a request event on the server, we call the function. So we, you know, the postman gets his route and he walks down the code path for that. And we've only got one listener, but we could have several. And what would happen in that case is we would do the one, and then we would do the second one, and then we would do the third one, and so on, until we'd evaluated all of them. But the, the key part here is that Node... Um, you know, it does all of those things first. It's not launching any more events in the meantime. So step three is to go back to step two. So once, if, if I get a request, so the first thing is I get a request, um, and I run that request, if more requests come in in the meantime, so if, if you imagine I've got 
I've got my server and I get one user in and I start evaluating that person's request, if a second person comes in, it's not firing that second request event until it's entirely finished the first. It has to get back into, into the stage two where it's waiting for a request. It can't evaluate at the same time two things because node or the event loop, JavaScript, only does one thing at a time. That's, this is the really key important message is because it only does one thing at a time, it's never, it's never processing two events simultaneously. They're stacked up. They're all waiting to be evaluated. And that's, that's just really critical. But this also means that we can break the event loop. Um, you know, this is something where it's completely possible to, um, I mean, deadlock's the wrong word, but it's completely possible to, to lock it. So the way I think about it for the poor postman is uh, if somebody's got a locked gate, Right? He can't get in, and he wants to get in, and his whole job is just to get through the gate and you know, finish this function. But you know, even if we've got something waiting on the stack, even if the next event for the postman opens the gate, he'll never, ever, ever get through the gate because he has to get through the gate and finish the function in order to, do, to serve the next event and open the gate. Does that make sense to people? So this code looks like this. Um, actually, I, I, there's, there's something secretly pleasurable about writing code that breaks things. I don't know. That's just me. Um, slight touch of, uh, of evil genius, I think. No? Um, not, I'm not born and don't have a cat, but don't let that stop you. Um, so in this code, we require the event emitter object for node. So this is, this is our event handler um, for node. Because you know, some of the event stuff uh, to... to um, to listen to events and to, to serve them doesn't exist natively in JavaScript. Um, I, I create a variable called die, um, and I set an event listener that says on die, um, die equals true. So I'm going to set this thing to true. Um, I then set a timeout function. So the timeout um, emits, so it, it's, it sends out the event die, right? Um, and then finally, I set this while not die. So as long as die is false, we're just going to keep looping. Now, you might think, well, OK, this timeout is going to run, and it's going to set die to false, and then we'll break. Well, we won't break, because JavaScript can never run this timeout. This timeout will never, ever get called, because the, the, the JavaScript interpreter is busy running the loop. The loop's just running and running and running and running, and the event will never get fired. And this is, this is true in the browser, this is true in the server, um, and this is the point about only executing one thing at once. And I think this is, people kind of think, uh, people imagine because events, you know, they expect them to be real time, when it's fired, it's fired. When it's fired, it's queued. And that's the important point. So I, I realize that I'm kind of, I'm like hammering this, but I think this is, this is a really critical piece of understanding. And, and for me personally, However long I coded in the browser, this didn't really hit home until I started coding in the server, and I burned myself a bunch. Um, so what does this stuff matter? Well, um, particularly on the server, let's look at something like this. So uh, var result equals db.query select something. So you know, some query like this, if you did something like this, you know, what would you expect? You, you, know, you call it, and then if you're calling PHP, you get a result back instantly. Or not instantly, but you get a result back, and then you carry on with your flow of execution, right? So you call something, and stuff happens, and then it comes back. What are we actually waiting for? Well, we're waiting for the database server to spin up its disks, you know, read through a bunch of indexes, do whatever nonsense that the database does, and we serve that stuff back to the client. But that means that, think about this in our JavaScript context, if we wait the whole time for the database in order to spin up, because disk access takes a long time, you're talking you know, hundreds of milliseconds um, compared to you know, the, the picoseconds for the CPU to do stuff. Um, so factors slower to, to do the database request, and we just sit there and wait. And we talked about this. The event loop is now stuck. We can't handle any new requests. We can't do any other things because we're sat waiting for the database to spin and to do stuff. And, to, and, and this is actually, I mean, if you think about the browser, this is why people invented 
HTML5 web workers. If you want to do hard cryptography, if you want to do like all of this stuff, if you start running some massively slow function in your browser JavaScript, then you don't get any on mouse clicks. You don't get anything because the browser is just churning, waiting to finish that big function. So this is, this is really critical. So um, blocking is as bad as stopping because you know, even if you don't actually really deadlock, even if you don't create a condition where it's impossible for the event loop to continue, if you block it for a long time, you know, you're not serving any, any other requests. There's no parallelism. There's no, you know, there's no chance that you're doing anything else. And if you're building servers in a server-side JavaScript environment and you block, it's, you might as well have stopped because you've created a condition now where one user is hogging the whole system resource. So this is, this is why we avoid this. This is why we have non-blocking APIs in Node where if you want to access the database, if you want to access the file system, if you want to make an HTTP request as a client, all of those things return events. All of those things have a callback to get them out of the event loop, to make the return um, response a callback. So this... Um, I really like. So this is, um, it's not Node, but uh, Nginx is an event-driven proxy. So it uses the same concept. And, you know, Nginx is pretty fast. We're comparing it to Apache. So the two, these two programs both do the same thing. They both serve web pages. Um, and this graph shows with a lot of users. So starting off at zero and up to 4,000 concurrent users. So 4,000 people connected to the machine at any single time. Um, it shows the amount of concurrent requests they're able to serve. And actually, I'd be really uh, interested to see um, exactly what spec of machine they ran Apache on to get, you know, these kinds of specs. Because it's, you know, Yahoo machines don't have this, these many people connected. Yahoo machines tend to, I think, top out at like 1,000 users-ish. Um, but the, um, you can see that basically the event loop, um, you know, it kind of peaks early, but then it's this really flat line. And that's important because basically once uh, the event loop gets going, um, all it's doing is it's, it's, you know, it gets a request in and then it says, I want some IO. And then it doesn't get blocked. It doesn't stop because it's waiting for the disk to spin or, you know, any other thing. It's just, it's, you know, it's taking the request in and then it's feeding them out. So it, it's, it hardly gets slower at all. Apache, on the, on the other hand, kind of hits a point and then it's massively declining. And the reason for that is Apache um, uses threads. Apache takes all of the resources of the system and it chops them up into pieces and it says, you know, I've, I can handle, you know, maybe a thousand simultaneous users, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chop my resources up into a thousand pieces. And as soon as I hit a thousand users, now any new connection that I get I have, to, I have to completely finish and clear out one, one of my thousand connections in order to give this new user a spot. They can't have a spot until I've completely finished the request. So in some ways, the individual requests are served absolutely as fast as possible. But on aggregate, the machine runs out of resources and it starts thrashing, starting to, trying to switch between the users very fast. So this is, this is one of the reasons why the event loop is becoming really popular. And you can see you know, the same effect with the memory. Um, Nginx at the bottom you know, has a very stable memory footprint because it's, you know, it's not assigning new resources as it gets more and more and more people connected. Apache, on the other hand, is slicing down its ability to do stuff and it's using more memory as it gets more users connected because it's, it's trying to allocate a piece of all of its system memory to each of those users as they connect. So um, this is a really interesting concept for me because I think uh, it explains why this model is getting popular, why people are starting to do this more over a traditional model like Apache. Um, and more than that is I think it says the less you block, the more uh, I.O. that Node can do. And this is important because it's not just you know, the, um, the blocking isn't just reading from something slow like a file system. It's if you write a big, long function that takes ages, you're blocking too. So the more that you can write in a style that makes you event-driven, the better. Which, of course, leads us on to programming style. Um, all of this would be great if it was just, you know, kind of me talking about theory, but, you know, it's important to talk about that. So 
Um, this is specific to the server, but what kinds of applications do we build? We've got command line apps. Um, we've got things like web servers, maybe some streaming servers or peer-to-peer. Um, I, I kind of generalize this down. The way that I think about this is main scripts, which is we looked sort of earlier at the idea of kind of just running down main um, and, and something that just does that, that first pass. That's a main script. Um, request and response-driven servers. So I think like an HTTP server is entirely driven by a request and a response. Um, and then a streaming server, so something which has a stream that goes back and forth and the events are based on that. So the main scripts, really simple, uh, command line scripts, in general they don't do very much because there's no, you're not using any events. So uh, I like writing my command line scripts in JavaScript now because I can and I like JavaScript, um, but this is kind of a small use case. The main use case is this kind of request response and I think what's interesting about this is um, it's really discrete. So you have, uh, it's not like a streaming server. It's I have a request and I give it a response and then I'm done. And what's important is that you encapsulate the request and the response. So if you think about something like Apache, by, by doing threads, Apache is naturally encapsulating every request. It just spawns a new thread per connection and that's naturally encapsulated. Each connection is naturally in its own little sandbox. Because we're using an event loop, everything's in shared memory. Everything is shared between all of the clients. And that gives us this performance benefit, but it also means that unless you uh, make sure that you're encapsulating properly, you know, potentially one person's request could be shared with another person's request. And that's, that's not necessarily a situation we want, right? Um, obviously. Um, if, I think if FireSheep has taught us anything, um, yeah. So the... I think um, what's interesting for me is kind of, you know, JavaScript has this great device for doing that, is uh, Clojure. JavaScript has Clojures, and that's a great device for encapsulating stuff. Um, and then, of course, streaming. So arbitrary in or out data, um, and the stream may or may not be encapsulated. So, for example, you might have something like a, um, uh, uh, a Comet server that you've built, you know, or, or web sockets or something like that. And that's going to be fairly encapsulated because you're going to have one connection per user. So that connection is going to be encapsulated to one, to one specific user. But you may also have servers that don't need to be encapsulated if they're streaming. So we're going to go back to the, the simple web server as kind of a code example. And uh, again, in this, you know, I've, I've used this time the, the default from uh, the node docs. This is just what's on the on the Node.js homepage. I've not rewritten it at all this time. Um, and, you know, let's kind of break this down. So you can see, essentially, you know, all, all we're really doing, um, and this is the same for the previous example I did, but all we're really doing is function um, request response. So when I create the server, this anonymous function that gets passed is, this is, uh, you know, this is what we're going to use for requests and responses. This is, we're creating closures. But what's, what's interesting is because we're using anonymous function instead of using some named function is each of these gets instantiated every time. So whenever I get a request, I get a new anonymous function. I don't use the same one, right? It's not shared between all the requests because remember we're in shared memory, right? We're in a single event loop. So whenever the server gets a request, it has to make a new anonymous function. So that's, that's kind of an important thing. But the problem with anonymous callbacks is you end up with code looking like this. So if you imagine, you know, when we, bless you, when we um, use a server, you know, we don't have code that looks like this. We have code that looks like this, and then it's got a bunch of stuff inside it. I want a request from the file system. I want a request from the database. I want a request from, like, all of these places. Um, if you do all of those callbacks with anonymous things like this in order to create a closure, you end up with code that looks like this. You start off with the first anonymous function, and then inside that is another anonymous function, another one, until it just kind of it goes all the way out, and you're like, okay, I'm done. Close, 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 close. Right? Um, and that code is hard to read, um, and it's really, really hard to debug. So an anonymous function has done this. Okay. Uh, which one? Right? And it's, you know, it it gets really frustrating. So what I'm proposing um, is this. This is um, a skeleton 
for creating servers, um, a server-side pattern for, for, uh, for Node and, and for any server-side JavaScript, really. And it's really simple. N none of this is like particularly rocket science. I've used Node syntax, but this is like fairly obvious stuff. So the first thing is we require system. Um, this is basically, and, and, and actually, I mean, I, you, could, you could rewrite all of this stuff. So Dave's been talking about how to do this stuff uh, on Node with YUI. A lot of this stuff is also in YUI. So there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't just include YUI and then use you know, the familiar YUI syntax to do a bunch of this stuff. I've just written it in raw Node just because um, that seemed like an easy way to go about it. But there's no reason why, if you're more comfortable with YUI, you couldn't do it that way. So sys... Um, which has been renamed util um, in the in the uh, the dev branch of Node. Um, in case just the uh, if anybody gets confused with that, so in the dev branch it's called util, but it's the same thing. Um, has this method inherits, and all that is is that's a really simple object inheritance pattern, right? So it's just it's it's adding uh, a super type. It's allowing to add uh, super pseudo classes to stuff, so we can use the the methods from those. Um, on our prototypes, and you can see we've also we've got this class event emitter. So JavaScript doesn't natively have a way to uh, do event to do event listeners and a, a native way to to throw events. So again, Node has this event, event emitter. You could use YUI. That's fine too. So like all of this is completely rewritable in YUI. Um, the next thing that we do is create a server. Um, this is designed as a common JS module. So in the way that in the previous examples we're including the HTTP module, this is the format that you would use in order to write one. So the important thing is I create a server pseudo class. Notice, notice the capital S. Um, hopefully I'm making Crockford proud. And uh, we've got exports.server. So exports is a global name for a variable which um, provides the closure. So we're not using the module pattern. When we write common JS modules, we don't use anything like the module pattern in order to encapsulate the common JS framework does that for us. So we simply use the exports module and attach things to that in order to, uh, in order to share them. And notice I've not redeclared that. So it's already a global. The system already understands that it's there. You don't have to redeclare it as a variable. And if you do, it will break. Um, so I then create a server function. So um, you know, I've got a constructor. It does some stuff. Um, and then I do sys.inherit server event emitter. So my server is now an event emitter. I could, the event emitter has two methods, on and emit. And that means that now my server gets those methods. It can emit events and it, it can have events attached to it. So server.on something would attach an event. Um, and you can also, I mean, there's some more complex things you can dive into the into the listeners and reorder them and dork around. But in general, those are the two main things. The next thing that we do is on the server prototype, we create a request object. So instead of using anonymous, anonymous functions, we're creating a pseudo class specifically for events, for, for the requests. So we now know explicitly when I get a request, the object that I'm going to be dealing with is a request object. And it's the request object that's bound to this server. And that's important because it's on the prototype, and that means that when we instantiate this pseudo class, the requests that are created in that pseudo class belong to that server instance, that specific server instance. So not only do we have an instance, a bunch of instances of the requests, we also have an, um, a bunch of instances of the server. So you can run multiple servers and have their requests be independent, and you can modify the kind of uh, requests on each server. So that's also important. And then again, the request uh, pseudo class inherits from the event emitter. So the re requests themselves have a life cycle. They also have an event life cycle. Um, and then we create two factory methods. So we're creating one to create new requests. Um, and what that does is it returns a new this request. So notice we're returning it belonging to that server. Um, and then we have another one. We export a method. To, uh, to return new servers. Um, and this is kind of a weird thing. Um, you know, surely the user could just call new themselves. Um, one of the kind of interesting quirks about JavaScript is if you call the new method, um, it binds to the first closure it finds. So if, if you did new 
require some server. It, it, it creates a new require. It doesn't create a new, a new returned object. You'd have to wrap it in braces. Does that make sense to people? So if you call new, it just finds the first thing in scope that it can call and then instantiates that, which is not, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. So we tend to use a lot of factory methods, but I think it's useful. Um, and that means that you can do something like this. Now, typically, you can see I've used an underscore because I would actually typically have this built in as part of the server. Um, but I think this is kind of an interesting example. But um, so var server, so I've created a server object, create server.create server name. And what I haven't actually included in here is, is including the server as a module, but you would have require, you know, server. Um, var server equals server.create server, and then server.on request, um, we pass it server.underscore create request. So we pass it that constructor method, which then instantiates a new object for that request. And that request is going to live, it's going to do stuff, and then it's going to die. So create new server. We listen for requests. When a request happens, we do uh, on request create new request. Um, and that encapsulates the request state in the request object, right? So this is an individual. And notice, again, the capitalization. So we're creating a new request from the request pseudo class, but then we end up with an object instance of that, which, has, which binds our encapsulation. It binds the data for that specific request from the user that's different from all other requests, even though they share the same methods. Um, and then we can do request lifecycles. Life cycle. So inside that, we get something like this. We get a server, which gets a request, creating a new encapsulation of a request object. And inside that, we can have a whole life cycle. So you know, the request itself, it can get a new request. And you know, we call the constructor, and everything kind of boots up. But then it says, well, the first thing that I need to do is I need to init. So I throw the init um, event, and I listen for the init event. And, and when I get the init event, I then call a database query. And when the database query returns, I then call my database response um, callback. And then, you know, so on. I go around file ready and, you know, I do all this stuff. So inside the request, you can bind to your request pseudo class a bunch of, a bunch of again, named functions that get called in sequence. And that means that you can draw a pretty graph like this. And you can look at that and you can say, well, this kind of makes sense. This is obvious. The server gets a request. It creates a new request object. And then what happens? Well, it's easy for me to follow along with the code because I know that the first thing that happens is it calls the init function, which calls the database query function, which calls the file access function, which calls you know process, which calls respond, and presumably respond send something back to the client. So you can, you can go through these whole steps, and you can start to map out, here are the things. If you do it with anonymous functions, you can't, because it would be anonymous, 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 anonymous. And I think having this kind of named approach, where it's really systematic, is, is incredibly helpful. It's incredibly easy to understand and to use. So uh, I think what I'm going to do really quickly, um, we've got a little bit of time left. So I created a blow this up a little bit. Uh, so this is a slightly more concrete, only, only slightly, ever so very slightly uh, version of this. I, I, have, I have other examples that uh, are much more concrete, um, but they're not necessarily great for a presentation. Um, but you can basically see, so this is you know, the same pattern, but now we have a few, a few things that get done. Uh, so when the constructor gets called, we throw a new server to the console, um, you can see that uh, we've got these uh, prototypes. Um, so when we create a request, um, we pass uh, request and response. Um, and then uh, when we create the, the actual, the constructor for the request object, logs those. So we, I mean, I'm not actually using like a whole chain of stuff that happens, but you can see that I'm now starting to do stuff. And you know, I just wanted to kind of show this in, in practice just so you can see what it might look like. So um, one other thing that I really like about Node, um, and actually, I, I, uh, I guess I'm not going to show it, but um, this is, uh, so I, I switched from TextMate to, to, to Vi, and I really like it because there's this rad plugin that basically uh, allows me to just copy and paste code straight into a Node REPL. So this is a Node REPL, and it's basically, um, you know, uh, 
it, it's just a JavaScript shell. So, you know, true equals true, true. Um, I guess you can't, it's kind of hard to, re, trying to hard to read blue and that's cut off as well. It's not good. Uh, there we go. You can kind of see the, the horrible blue. Um, so it's just a node. It, it, it's just a node shell which then just interprets JavaScript. So um, what I've got is you can see that this is uh, server.js and it's just living in my home directory. So what I'm going to do is right now I'm going to be in my home directory. So I'm going to do uh, server equals require dot slash server. Um, note that when you require common JS modules, I'm not including the file extension. We just include straight, um, and it, it's now told me what I've got. So I've got, uh, it's returned this, uh, this object, and inside the object you've got a server, which has got a function and a bunch of stuff on it, and then it's got this create server function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, server, lowercase, equals server, server, yeah, dot create server. No, what did I do? Create server. Apparently they're Greek. Um, and so now I created a new server and it threw that constructor event, new server, not rocket science so far, um, or po possibly at all. Um, <laughs> So we have that, and what we what we need to do is we need to fire um, the this this object. So whenever we when we get a request, we want to uh, attach this kind of create listener. So what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, server dot on. So remember we've inherited from the event emitter request, and then we're going to do that um, server dot underscore create. Request. Ooh. Hopefully, there we go. So, um, and this is now, so this is the response from the event emitter library. It gives us back the list of events attached to that specific event, the list of functions attached to that event. Um, and then finally, what we can do is we can do server.emit. And again, like typically, you, I mean, you wouldn't, you know, in your, in your code, do the emits. The server's going to do the emits itself. My server's so simple, it has nothing to emit from. There's no HTTP to, to do it. So I'm just doing this by hand to illustrate. But, you know, typically this would be done by the server itself. Um, and I'm going to send it, you know, ABC um, and DEF. You know, here, here are some, you know, this is the request object and this is the response object. And again, this is like a really sort of terse example, but you know, you can imagine these being used for something, something else, and it creates, it constructs the new request object, and we have those, and they're encapsulated. So this is the kind of basic flow where, you know, we take, um, you know, each of the instances, and now we have something that we can debug. Now we have a bunch of named stuff that's easy for me to communicate to somebody else and say, this is what happens when this server runs, and yes, everything is powered by events. No, the code is not one linear piece of code that you can read from top to bottom, and it's all driven by events, but now it's really easy for me to express to somebody else what the life cycle of the server is. Now I can say, you know, the chain of callbacks looks like this, all of the callbacks have names. Everything's encapsulated. Everything's easy to find. And more than that is there's a hierarchy in the server that says that each server is an individual server, and each server owns its set of requests, and the set of requests that it owns are completely distinct from the set of requests owned by another server. And you can change the prototypes, and you can change the things for that server without risking affecting any of the other servers. And I think that's really important, and it gives us a really powerful pattern to write server-side JavaScript with. So, to summarize, the event loop does one thing at a time. Um, a loop loops until um, events aren't fired. Yeah. Um, emitted events run immediately. So if, uh, that's one thing to note, is if you emit an event, if, if the, uh, when I call the emit function, that's actually just a synchronous function. It simply looks at event emitter and calls all of the functions in line. Um, define a server structure. Use factory methods to, to do the encapsulation. Don't use anonymous functions to do your encapsulation. Um, and use events to maximize the event loop, to maximize the amount that you can switch between tasks and use things as much as possible, rather than having monster, 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 
uh, functions which block your event loop. 